How's it going everybody? Welcome back to Bark Forge. Today's video we're going to be talking about how to fully rebuild the Dana 30 front axle in your Jeep or truck. We're doing a full rebuild including all seals, bearings, uh, reshimming everything, putting in good quality ring and pinion from Yukon Gears. And we are going from a 355 to a 456 gear ratio. Uh, and that's to correct for the larger tire size. I'm running 33 inch tires. We will also be installing a Powertrax no-slip lunchbox style automatic locker to this front diff. And we're going to be doing a cut and turn mod to the axle housing itself, meaning we're going to be cutting off both ends of the axle housing uh, where the C's are and rotating them a specific amount um, to correct for our caster angle. And I'll get into why you might want to do that or might need to do that uh, in a little bit. And while we have the axle apart for all these things, we're going to be installing an axle truss and an axle sleeve, and that's going to add a lot of strength to this Dana 30. So before we go any further, if you guys could uh, please drop a like, please subscribe to the channel, uh, it would mean a lot, uh, and it'll help me bring some more content like this in the future. Alright, so let's get right into it. The first thing I'm going to do here is actually remove the entire axle from the truck, but you might not necessarily have to do that. The biggest deciding factor here is how much of this project you're actually going to be doing. Um, if you're just rebuilding the axle, um, the diff portion and re-gearing, you might not need to pull the axle. However, if you're going to be installing an axle truss uh, and you're going to be cutting and turning the C's, it's going to be really difficult to really do this job without removing the axle from the truck. Um, in my opinion, even if you are just doing uh, an internal rebuild, it's probably going to be worth the time it takes to pull the axle um, later on because it only takes about an hour to pull this axle out of the truck and it's going to really save you a lot of headache trying to rebuild the internals laying on the ground. If you have a lift, it's no problem, you leave it in. But for me, it was really worth the amount of time it takes to pull it. Now the next thing you're going to need to do obviously is remove the diff cover and drain the diff fluid. Now when I removed the axle, I actually kept the axle shafts in each side so that no fluid would accidentally pour out as I was moving it onto my bench. So now you're going to want to make sure the uh, diff is nice and clean since everything is covered in old stinky diff fluid. So um, all I did was put my drain pin underneath and spray everything really good with brake clean. It takes a few cans to really get everything nice and clean in there, but uh, it's worth the hassle. And then you're going to want to start cleaning off the old gasket material off of the mating surface of the diff cover. Um, you want to be careful not to scratch the surface either, so use a, you know, a plastic scraper if you have one available. So next you need to actually start disassembling the differential. Uh, now, the first thing you're going to need to do is remove the bearing caps. Uh, and it's important when you're removing the bearing caps that you take note of their orientation because they have to go back the same way. If you look here on the screen, you can see stamped on the mating surface for the diff cover is a horizontal H. Um, it might not be the same marking for you, but mine just happens to be horizontal H. Um, and what you can't see is that on the bearing cap right next to this is the same horizontal H stamped. If we move over to the other side, we can see that we have a vertical H stamped to the bearing cap and a vertical H stamped to the axle housing. Now, to line everything up, all you have to do is make sure that those marks um, are, are aligned when you reassemble everything. So. Um, the letters have to be next to each other and they have to match and as long as that's true uh, you always have the bearing caps in the right orientation. If those marks aren't there um, all you need to do is make them yourself with a punch or some sort of marking tool. So once you get the bearing caps removed um, I would probably take this opportunity just to do a little more cleaning because under there there's going to be a lot more um, <clears throat> gear oil that you weren't able to get to before. So you can see I'm just spraying everything down and rotating the carrier. And at this point, you're actually ready to remove uh, the carrier and ring gear assembly. Now, this may or may not be kind of difficult. Uh, it really depends on your axle. But uh, for me, and for most people, all you're really going to need is a pry bar uh, that you can stick inside of the housing and pry the carrier out the front of the housing. Now, be careful here, uh, if you're not replacing your bearings, uh, make sure you don't drop the bearing raises on the ground like I did. You're going to want to keep everything as nice as possible um, and free of contamination. So here's our old uh, carrier and our old carrier bearings. You can see they're pretty toasted. There's a lot of scoring on the actual bearings themselves, so definitely time to change these bearings out uh, like I thought. Um, for reference, this axle has 170,000 miles on it, so it's definitely time for uh, a rebuild. Now it's time to remove your old axle shaft seals. Uh, this part's actually really easy. All you really need is 
something long that you can insert down the length of the axle tube and hammer on to punch the seal into the axle housing. So what I did was just take a bunch of half inch extensions um, and run them through the axle housing and you can see that those punch the seal out no problem. Now once you get the seals out, uh, it's going to be time to actually clean out your axle tubes because they're no doubt full of a lot of dirt and grime and if you had a uh, axle shaft seal leak like I did, uh, it's going to be really nasty in there because there's going to be a lot of dirt and gear oil mixed up and kind of congealed inside the axle tube. So I made a little tool to do this. Um, basically it's just a piece of bar stock bent um, with the end ground to match the inner diameter of the axle tube. That way I can stick the tool inside of the axle tube and push or pull all of the uh, dirt and gear oil crap out towards the outside of the axle housing. You never want to push it into the axle housing because then you're going to get all that stuff inside of your diff. So pulling it out is the best bet. Now this first half I did was all dry because it's dirt. Um, but the other half was actually where my leak was, so it's dirt combined with gear oil and it's it's really nasty. So uh, I ended up tying a plastic bag over the end of the axle housing and then using uh, brake clean and my tool to uh, push as much of that stuff out as I could. Then the last thing you want to do is just ball up a bunch of paper towels and push them through the axle tube and that should clean out uh, everything else. You might have to do this a few times before you to get it to come out clean but you want as little contamination in there as possible because it's going to make it a lot easier for you to slide the axle sleeves in later on. So now it's time to remove the pinion. Uh, this is going to be really easy if you have an impact gun and a little tougher if you don't. Um, if you have an impact gun, you can easily just hold back on the pinion with your hand and back the pinion nut off. Uh, but if you don't have an impact gun, you're going to need to somehow keep that pinion from turning um, and use a breaker bar to break that nut loose. Once the pinion nut is removed, uh, remove the washer, and then you have to pound the yoke off of the pinion. Um, I found it easy to hold the yoke and then hammer on the actual pinion itself. Uh, just make sure that your pinion doesn't go flying out the other side of the diff uh, if you do this. If you're replacing the pinion, it doesn't matter nearly as much, but I found that to be the easiest way to do it. Now, usually the next step would be to pound out the uh, pinion bearing races and remove the rear pinion bearing but I actually skipped that for now to move on to cutting and turning the axle housing. Um, I'll end up removing those later on when I start the rebuild. So if uh, you're not doing the cut and turn, I would skip ahead uh, to the actual rebuild portion. For now though, what I've done is strap the axle housing down to my bench so it can't rotate uh, because I'm gonna come in here with a Sawzall and begin cutting the ends of the axle tube. Now, Using the Sawzall, probably not the best way to do this, but it was really the only way uh, I could pull this off with what I had. If you could manage to jig this axle up in a horizontal bandsaw or possibly use a porta band, I think that would be the best way. But um, using the Sawzall did a good enough job. Ideally, I would have liked to use an angle grinder if I had one big enough, but um, the diameter of the angle grinder that I had, it couldn't reach far enough to actually cut through the housing. So I had to go with the Sawzall. Um, it didn't give me a perfect cut, which does make it more difficult to line everything up when it's time to weld it back together. Um, but if uh, Sawzall is all you have, I think it's more than capable of doing this job. I think now is a good enough time to stop and kind of talk about why do the axle cut and turn in the first place? What does it do? So uh, the main reason you would want to do a cut and turn to your axle housing is to correct your caster angle. Uh, your caster angle is essentially uh, the rotation of that axle C uh, and subsequently your knuckle that's attached to it at the end of your axle housing in relation to the rest of the axle, you know, the center portion of the axle housing. So this image does a really good job of showing what I mean, I think. Um, you see from a side view that the end of the axle housing, the part with the ball joints that's shaped like a C, like we've been looking at, is actually rotated six degrees in this case, positive compared to the center line of the axle also known as, you know, where your pinion shaft comes out of. So this is what's known as positive caster. Now, if it was rotated downward, uh, counterclockwise in this case, uh, that would be negative caster. Now, positive caster is what you want because positive caster is what keeps your truck, your car, whatever you're driving, it's what keeps it tracking straight down the road. It also helps your steering uh, react uh, quicker to your inputs. So on a solid axle truck, like my Jeep, 
Uh, lifting the truck causes a lot of steering geometry and suspension geometry to fall out of spec. Um, anyone with a lifted truck knows that there's a lot of different things you need to do to account for that. Now, one thing that you can't do on a solid axle suspension is adjust your caster angle independently of your pinion angle. So what is your pinion angle? Well, in this case, we're talking about the front axle of a Jeep Cherokee. Uh, the front axle is going to be a double carden uh, axle setup. Now, in this image, it's a CV, but for simplicity's sake, they're the same thing. Now, our pinion angle is basically the angle at which the pinion yoke meets the drive shaft, uh, which goes into the transfer case. Now, in this case, we want our pinion to essentially point directly at that drive shaft to prevent the drive shaft U-joint from binding and causing vibrations um, because that'll just destroy your drive shaft and the U-joint and potentially your axle. Now this problem presents itself when you lift your truck because um, the farther out of spec your pinion angle is the more and more that vibration will occur um, to the point where you can't drive the vehicle in that state because you'll you'll break something. Uh, however you can drive a vehicle that has a really poor caster angle so for that reason the manufacturer will always um, say to prioritize pinion angle over caster angle if you can't uh, have both to be in spec. Now why can't you have both be in spec? Well this is a solid axle and the pinion angle and the caster angle do not have any adjustments. Uh, you know the adjustment for each of those would be to rotate the entire axle housing so if you rotate the entire axle housing to correct one issue you're gonna throw uh, the other issue out of spec. So I'll do a little drawing here uh, to show what happens when you lift your truck. Um, let's say the red line is the body of the truck and the green line is the drive shaft. So in this case, as we lift the body of the truck uh, and it becomes farther away from the axle, uh, we need to rotate the axle housing uh, negatively, counterclockwise in this case, to keep that pinion pointed at that drive shaft. But as you can see, if I mark the original caster angle, as we rotate the axle housing to fix the pinion angle, we are now negatively rotating our caster angle, which is going to cause us a lot of steering issues. Now, the easiest way to combat this without having to cut and weld anything is just to find a happy medium between pinion angle and caster angle that works for you. So as you can see here, the pinion angle is imperfect. The caster angle has still been rotated negatively. But in this case, and in most people's cases, uh, it's probably still just fine to drive and uh, you don't have to worry about it anymore. In my case, I figured why not have the best of both worlds. Uh, and Instead of just finding a happy medium where I can steer okay and my pinion angle is okay, I want to have great steering and great pinion angle. And the only way to do that is to do the cut and turn of your axle tube. Now, the next question is going to be, how do I know how much to actually turn the ends of my axle tubes? Uh, you know, if I don't have uh, alignment equipment, how could I possibly find that out? Um, despite what you might read online, there is no for sure way to measure your caster at home. There is no way to use an angle finder, this or that, to measure your caster. You can measure your pinion angle that way, but not your caster. So the only way to find out what your caster is so that you know how much you need to adjust it is to go to an alignment shop and have them give you a printout of all the measurements of your suspension. So that's what I did. So here's what my printout looked like. Um, after my alignment, I had them set my pinion angle perfectly, so I knew my pinion angle isn't going to change. Um, and from there, I can work on improving my caster angle. And you can see from the printout that my caster angle is currently at about 3.6 degrees. Now, the spec caster angle for a completely non-modified Jeep um, if I remember correctly, it was somewhere between four and a half to eight degrees, something like that. Um, and I knew I wanted to fall on the upper end of that uh, range because from what I've read, uh, the more tire and the more lift you have, uh, a little more caster is really going to help you keep the Jeep on the road and not have your steering wander all over the place, which is what's going to happen if you have poor caster. So now that you have this printout with this caster measurement, you have a baseline from which you can work off of. So my baseline is now 3.6 degrees, and I'd like to be on the upper end, ideally, of the range. So probably around 8.5 degrees. Uh, so by rotating these axles positively, 4.9 degrees, I'll go from 3.6 degrees, the current measurement, to 8.5, the new measurement. All right, guys, we're going to pause the voiceover for a minute.
so we could talk about what's going on here. So as you just saw, I cut the C right here. Um, I cut the axle tube with the sawzall. Uh, not a perfectly straight cut, but it, it should be fine. I don't think it's gonna be a big deal. So what I did is I took the axle sleeve and I've slid it through. This is the long one, by the way. This is the axle sleeve for the other side because I can slide it through here all the way through and into this side so I know everything's perfectly straight and aligned. And then I took a big ratchet strap and I ratcheted the axle down to the table so that it can't rotate because if it rotates, it's gonna mess up our angles and our measurements. Um, it doesn't matter that this isn't perfectly flat because we're gonna zero our angle finder to this face to get our baseline. Right before I cut the C off, I made three marks. I don't know if you can see in there, you can kind of see. Um, come on, focus. There's three marks, one, two, and then there's a third one over there. Um, so by lining those up, I now have the axle in the exact position that it was when I cut it. Now, right now, my caster angle, when everything is assembled, is 3.6 degrees. And I want it to be closer to around eight degrees because I want a little bit extra control because um, I'm really not happy with my steering. So what I have to do now is figure out how much to rotate this C to get that perfect angle. Now, as you can see, because I have the axle sleeve in here, I could just take this whole thing and rotate it wherever I need it and then weld it back together. So this is gonna be really simple to actually pull off. The only tricky part is gonna be figuring out what the actual angles are. So. I'm gonna line up my three marks again. You can see it's got a little bit of a wobble to it, but I'll make sure to strap it up tight against the, the face so that that isn't an issue. So right now we're exactly where we were before and we're gonna figure out what our baseline is. So I'm gonna take my angle finder here. I'm gonna put it on this perfectly flat surface, which is the diff, diff cover, uh, where the diff cover gasket sits. I'm gonna turn it on and I'm going to zero it out. So right now that is set to zero. Now, like I said before, I have the axle ratcheted down to the table so that it can't rotate because if it rotates, it's gonna mess us up. So now with this set to zero, I'm gonna take this angle finder and I'm gonna put it right on the inside of the axle C right there, right on this flat spot in there. And when we look in here, we can see we were at uh, 79.5 degrees. So this angle kind of means nothing, right? This isn't a real number that anyone goes off of, but I'm just using this number to figure out exactly how much I need to rotate the tube, right? So I'm gonna do this a couple times just to verify, make sure my mark is good. I'm gonna zero it out again. I'm gonna put it back over here, get it on there. 79.6, I'll do it one more time. 0.1 degrees of, of 0.1 degrees isn't going to be a problem. Got it sitting there again. 79.6. All right, so we'll call it 79.6. And the surface of this C in here is kind of rough. That alone could account for the 0.1 degree. So all we really have to do now is do a little math. So we're sitting at 79.6, 0 0.5, whatever it is. <laughs> now to add caster, let's, let's orient the axle the way it would be on the road, right? Um, this would be facing forward. Now to add caster, we would be rotating this knuckle this way. So the more I rotate this clockwise, the more positive caster I'm adding. So if we look at our marks here, we can see our marks. This is where the axle was. Come on. You can see that. This is where the axle was. And then as we add caster, you can see that our marks are moving to the right there. Now from here on, we don't need these marks anymore because we know that as long as this face is set to zero degrees and this C, the inside of this C is set to 79.5 degrees, then we're at the stock location. So even if I come in and grind these out, cause I'm gonna have to do that to bevel this pipe, to weld it. Even if we do that and we lose the marks, it's fine. Cause we have our number 79.5, 79.6. So that being said, um, as we rotate this axle this way, the, uh, you see the number actually decreases, 76, 69, I mean it flips, but you can see what I'm talking about, 66. So this is where the little bit of math comes in. Now, as I mentioned before, my current caster angle is 3.6 degrees, and I want it to be at the upper end, and I want it to be at the upper end of the range. So we're gonna shoot for eight and a half, 
because I've read in a lot of places that a little bit extra caster with bigger tires is going to help out your driving performance. So we're going to shoot for eight and a half. So all we have to do to get there is just go to our calculator. We're going to do 8.5 degrees minus 3.6 degrees and we get 4.9 degrees. So what that tells us is to get this angle perfect, this needs to be rotated clockwise 4.9 degrees. We know that this baseline here, once everything's zeroed out, is going to be 79.6 degrees. So let's subtract because since, like I said before, as we rotate the C clockwise, we're subtracting. So we're going to do 79.6 degrees minus 4.9 degrees. And we're looking for 74.7 .7 on this angle finder when we are in the appropriate position. So I'm going to stick this back here. We're gonna, you see why we have to zero it out because as we move it around, it loses calibration. So zero that out again. Line up our marks right in here. So that's about, it's about perfect right there. Come in here, place our angle finder inside of the C. And then all we have to do is rotate that C until we hit 74.7 degrees. So let's do that. 74.7 right there. You can see how much our marks have moved. Our original marks, you can see that they're a little bit misaligned now. So that's it. Now, this isn't where it's going to sit finally because I have to pull this off and I have to bevel the pipe so I can get ready to weld this back together. But that's how easy it is to set that angle up the right way. Everyone has to find, a lot of people find a compromise between caster angle and pinion angle. If you don't want to compromise, this is a way to do it. So we're going to get ready to weld this back together. I'm going to have to put a pretty serious bevel on these pipes because they're pretty thick. And then using this sleeve, I'm going to tack this back together. We're going to confirm all the measurements. We're going to do the final welding of this and then we'll move on to the other side. We'll install the axle truss and then we can actually get to building this diff. So let's do it. So here I'm just using an angle grinder to put a nice bevel on each side of that cut axle tube. Uh, you're going to want to do this so that you get a full penetration weld. If you don't get a nice full penetration weld, you run the risk of uh, breaking this weld, which would be pretty catastrophic if you were driving or on the trail and that happened. So make sure you get a nice clean bevel. Um, and that way, when you put the two halves together, you have a nice V bevel uh, groove to weld into. Once you have both sides beveled and you get the uh, axle C in place where you want it, uh, according to your angle finder, uh, just pop a couple light tacks inside of that groove. You don't want to finish weld it right away because as you weld, that weld is going to shrink and it's actually going to pull and twist uh, slightly the axle C. So what I'm doing here is putting a couple tacks, testing the angle, and then with a mallet, um, adjusting the final position of the C because, like I said, as the tacks go in and they shrink, it slightly rotates the uh, end of the axle housing. So put your tacks in, double check your measurements before finish welding the entire axle tube. So it was a little difficult to really get in there with the MIG gun um, because I didn't cut off the spring perches and the sway bar mount and all that. Um, it makes it kind of hard to get a nice full penetration because of the amount of stick out you have uh, with the MIG wire. But uh, in the end, uh, I was able to get it done. It just takes kind of more of a stitch weld and, and getting a little creative with your gun placement. All right guys, so I've done a few passes now. This is what it's looking like. Um, the welds aren't the prettiest ever because it was really difficult to get the MIG gun in here and all the weird nooks and crannies. So keep that in mind but i think this is going to be plenty strong i did one root pass two fill passes and then two caps just to kind of get everything nice and flush around the outside so and if you look inside you can just barely see where they've made it up again there's, there's literally almost zero gap not the prettiest thing in the world but i think it's going to work just fine so once you're finished with the one side, it's time to just flip the axle over and repeat the process the exact same way. And the only thing I would say to watch out for is if, if using this method of using the axle sleeve as a means to uh, align the axle housing before you weld it, um, it will get tight and you might have to bang out your axle sleeve in the end. So uh, I did have to end up using a couple extensions and a hammer to push the axle sleeve out of the axle once everything was welded because 
you know, the, the metal moves and it shrinks and you're going to get your axle tube, uh, you're going to get your axle sleeve stuck. So it's not a big deal. It comes out. It just might take a little bit of effort. So at this point, you're ready to install your axle truss. Now, I went with a really simple axle truss. This is the uh, Dirty 30 axle truss by K Suspension. Uh, I like K Suspension a lot. I also have my injectors from them, so I recommend uh, checking them out. And, and I went with this one because I didn't want to have to cut off any of my spring perches or my control arm mounts. I wanted something that I could just weld on to the axle as is. So this kit's great because you get a... Uh, single layer axle truss across the top between the upper control arm mount and the diff housing and you get a little gusset to stiffen up the upper control arm mount to keep it from crushing when you press in your uh, control arm bushing which does happen really easily it's pretty annoying so this should prevent that so what you saw me do here was do a quick dry fit of the uh, upper truss portion um, there's a few spots that i need to clean up because they're contacting the truss so it's not able to sit perfectly so I will say for this specific truss, you do have to do a little bit of grinding and modification to both the housing and the truss itself to get it to fit nice, but uh, it's really not that much work. So once you get the truss situated where you want it, um, it's just a matter of getting it finished welded into place. Uh, now keep in mind, for welding your axle truss to the axle tube, there's no preheating required because that's just simple steel tubing. Uh, however, the diff housing is a cast steel, so if you just try to go in and weld the two steels together, uh, either your welds aren't going to come out very nice at all, you might have some splattering, and you're probably going to have a very weak weld if it welds at all in the first place. So what you need to do for the portion uh, that welds your truss to your diff housing is to actually preheat the housing. Now, I didn't do this scientifically. Some people will measure you know, with a thermometer to make sure you get a good weld. I just went in with a map gas torch and heated it up until I felt like I had put enough heat into it. There was nothing scientific about it. Um, get it nice and hot. Uh, get it to where you think it'll be ready to accept that weld, and you shouldn't have an issue. If you are interested in figuring out the exact heat that you need to put in, uh, there are other channels that have covered that much better. I think Dirt Lifestyle uh, has a really good video about that, so I'll go check that out. So once the truss and the gusset are fully welded on, uh, it's time to now weld in your axle sleeves. Now, if you bought the pound-in style axle sleeve, obviously there's no welding involved. Uh, at the same time, though, using the pound-in style is not going to really work well uh, for uh, using it as a tool to align the axle C's for the cut and turn mod because obviously you'd be banging them in and out and it, it would be a mess. So um, I'm assuming at this point, if you're doing it this way, you're going to be buying a weld-in style axle sleeve. So the weld-in style uh, axle sleeve is super easy. According to the uh, instructions that came with it, uh, all you really need to do is mark three points along the uh, longer side of the axle on the front and the back, uh, equally spaced, and you're going to drill a half-inch hole at each of those points. So that's going to be six holes, three on each side, and then in those holes you're going to plug weld the axle sleeve into place. The same goes for the shorter side of the axle housing, um, but because it's shorter you're only going to be drilling one hole on each side um, and the same uh, weld on the outer end of the axle tube. So here I'm drilling the half inch holes, um, three holes equally spaced on this side and then two holes on the other side, and then pounding in the axle sleeves till it's just about flush with the inner side of the uh, end of the axle tube, just like that. You can see that the end of that axle sleeve is a little banged up. I did have a really tough time actually getting it through, probably because of the way the axle tube had shrunk or morphed a little bit from the welding. The whole end of that sleeve is going to get welded over anyway. So once your axle sleeve is in place, you can start to plug weld inside of the holes that you made earlier. There's really nothing much to this. Um, I really just welded until the plug welds were flush with the axle tube, and then I went back and I ground them flat so you couldn't see them anymore. Once you finish that, you can come in and weld around the circumference of the outer end of the axle tube, and that will finish your axle sleeve installation. So once I finished, I was uh, left with this. So you can see that the uh, inner axle sleeve has had a nice full penetration weld to the axle housing so that should give it a lot of extra strength and really reinforce uh, 
um, the welds we made on the uh, cut and turn. Alright guys, so that was it for part one. Um, that is how to do the cut and turn mod to your axle tube, how to disassemble your axle, how to install a axle truss and the uh, gusset that I put in there. And part two, we're going to be finishing the removal of the internals because um, as I mentioned earlier, we still have to remove the inner pinion bearing races and the uh, rear pinion bearing as well as the pinion seal. Um, once we do that, we're going to fully rebuild the axle, install our locker, install a nice new diff cover, and I'll go through through every step of the way on how to uh, install a new gear set into your axle uh, the right way. So thanks everybody for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. Check me out on Instagram at BarkForge, and I'll see you in the next episode where we finish rebuilding this Dana 30 for my Jeep Cherokee.